I want to thank you all again for being here, and it's been a pleasure to have this time to be together with all of you and to have this opportunity to reflect on John Courtney Murray, his ideas and his impact 50 years after his death. Uh, we're deeply honored to have with us His Excellency Bishop Robert McElroy, and Your Excellency, thank you for being here and for the reflections that you'll share with us in a moment. I wish to invite everyone to join us this evening for a conversation between Bishop McElroy and John Carr, the director of our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life on the topic of faith, common good, and democracy in a time of Pope Francis and President Trump. And joining them in this evening's program are Melissa Rogers, former executive director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, and Richard Garnett, associate dean at the University of Notre Dame Law School and founding director of Notre Dame's law school's program on church, state, and society. And that will take place right here in Copley Formal Lounge at 7 p.m. Uh, earlier this morning, I had the opportunity to recognize our team that helped us to come together to today, and I wish to take another moment to recognize and thank each of them. John Borelli, Sam Wagner, John Carr, Sean Casey, Tom Banchoff, David Hollenbach, Drew Christensen, Leon Hooper, Leo Lefebure, and Gerard Mannion. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing to you now our distinguished keynote speaker and guest, His Excellency Bishop Robert McElroy, and there are few better suited to be here with us today to illuminate the ways that John Courtney Murray's work can serve as a framework for public theology in the United States today. Bishop McElroy's scholarship has provided many of us with the historical and theological context to better understand Father Murray, his work, and its importance in fostering a religious foundation in American political life. His dissertation on John Courtney Murray was published as The Search for an American Public Theology, The Contribution of John Courtney Murray, a seminal text for all those who seek to apply Murray's ideas to the question of how religious values can enrich and deepen our political discourse. Bishop McElroy explained the writings of John Courtney Murray to be, in his words, quote, the most compelling and comprehensive foundation for public theology in the United States today, close quote, with the potential to again, in the bishop's words, quote, create a new unity among the American people through civility and discourse, close quote. Today, Bishop McElroy serves as the sixth bishop of the Diocese of San Diego. He also served as auxiliary bishop for the Archdiocese of San Francisco. In addition to his scholarship, his pastoral service, and his writing, Bishop McElroy has been a prophetic voice on the most pressing political and social issues facing American Catholics and our nation today. He's drawn on the teachings of Pope Francis to invite us to a deeper solidarity with our sisters and brothers across the country and the globe, one that restores humanity to public and political life. Earlier this year at the U.S. Regional World Meeting of Popular Movements, he called on those in attendance to be, quote, disruptors, close quote, of all efforts to harm the most vulnerable among us and to be rebuilders of a society that protects the dignity of the human person. Not only does he challenge us as Catholics to be alive to the pressing political issues of our time and of our responsibilities to the common good, his own willingness to be a powerful and public voice embodies what a public theology can look like today. Through his teachings and writings, he has brought ideas of faith and human dignity into our public conversation on workers' rights, on health care, on welfare, and on immigration. The next, the, these next few weeks are an urgent time for all of us to be able to support and advocate for our undocumented young people and their families who may face deportation. Bishop McElroy, your support of these young people and your leadership in our faith community is deeply appreciated and is urgently important, and particularly here at Georgetown as we will work alongside you in the protection of our undocumented students. So Your Excellency, we're deeply grateful for your leadership and we're so honored to have you with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bishop Robert, Robert McElroy. It's a great <clears throat> joy for me to be here 
Um, I remember it must be 30 years ago when a group of us were meeting in various times here at Georgetown and in Notre Dame uh, over a period of a couple of years. Leon, you were helping to organize that uh, to reflect on Mary, and here we are again. It's a great joy to be here and, and to deepen and update our reflections uh, on a man who left a great legacy to the church in the United States. <clears throat> we come together today to mark the 50th anniversary of the death of John Courtney Murray, the most significant Catholic theologian that the church in the United States has ever produced. Our reflections touch deeply on the past, rooted in Murray's lifelong devotion to the renewal of the church's stance on religious freedom, his powerful interventions as an interlocutor between Catholicism and American society, and his pivotal role in building up institutions such as theological studies and America. But our gathering today is absolutely not a retrospective enterprise. Instead, it is at its core a forward-looking one. Our conversations are framed not fundamentally by debates from the past, but by the issues of the church and our nation at this moment in our history. It is this reality that points to the most important gift which Murray's writings and life contributed to the church. His thought was so deeply rooted in the enduring questions of humanity, faith, and society, and so precise in its expression that we still find in his work a mind from which we can extract profound insights to address the most compelling questions that we face as a people of faith and a nation in this new millennium. For my part, I wish to focus on three elements of that legacy that have particular importance for the church and society in the America of 2017. The first is the issue of religious liberty. The second is the need for a public consensus for our nation in this hyper-partisan age. And the third is the issue of the development of doctrine. During the past decade, the issue of religious liberty has become deeply enmeshed in the bitter divide which grips our nation and corrupts political and moral dialogue. The church has an essential role to play in bridging this gulf. But for this to happen, the church's voice must speak coherently and authentically to the Catholic conception of religious liberty in its entirety. Slogans cannot substitute for substantive doctrine. There are two contending forces in our society which are challenging core elements of Catholic teaching on religious liberty. The first seeks to minimize the scope of religious liberty and specifically reduce the freedom of religious communities to the freedom of worship. The second seeks to maximize the exercise of religious conscience in society, undercutting the legitimate role the government has in advancing the common good. The minimalist school embodies the false notion of secularization that Murray fought against throughout his interventions in the debate on religious liberty. It deliberately undermines the freedom of the church by reducing religious expression in the community to the narrowest concepts of religious activity mainly that of worship. The policy position of the Obama administration, which erected a fourfold definition for religious activity that would qualify for a religious exemption under the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, was the Trojan horse for such a movement in federal law, as it had been introduced into the laws of New York and California. The church must emphasize that a robust appreciation for the specifically religiously inspired works of faith communities in healthcare, social service, and advocacy for the marginalized lie at the core of the gospel imperative, and that any realistic notion of religious liberty in the United States must acknowledge this. In We Hold These Truths, Murray outlined the moral and historical basis in American society for this expanse of freedom. Quote, the American Constitution does not presume to define the church 
or in any way to supervise her exercise of authority in pursuit of her own distinct ends. The church is entirely free to define herself and to exercise to the full her spiritual jurisdiction. It is legally recognized that there is an area which lies outside of government. This area coincides with the area of the divine mission of the church, unquote. There is no doubt that Murray would have regarded the present drift in American law and society toward a new minimalism as especially dangerous to religious communities and to the historic scope of religious freedom in our nation. The maximalist notion of religious freedom, on the other hand, can be detected in those within American society today who seek to undermine the legitimate authority of the state by endorsing an ever-expanding notion of individual rights of conscience in the public sphere without due regard for the governmental pursuit of the common good. This, too, is a distortion of the Catholic doctrine of religious liberty. Two there are. Murray defined the central fallacy of the maximalist position in his essay on the human right to religious freedom. He didn't use the word maximalism, but this is what he was saying. Maximalism, he explained, fallaciously asserts, quote, that a purely human power cannot forbid internal acts of conscience, and therefore, government is equally powerless to forbid external acts. But Murray points out that the right to conscience in public expression is ultimately rooted in the dignity of the human person and the pursuit of the common good. And the public order, that part of the common good which falls to government, is a wholly legitimate pursuit of government, even when that common good necessitates restrictions upon the public actions of believers acting in the light of their individual conscience. <clears throat> the church's doctrinal tradition is highly nuanced in this regard. And it is essential that this sense of nuance guide the Catholic participants community's participation in the current debates on neuralgic issues such as statutes touching upon sexual orientation and gender discrimination. In the coming years, the maximalist and minimalist positions will continue to come into bitter conflict within the United States. The church must articulate both internally and externally its substantive teaching on religious liter li liberty which rejects both of these extremes. It must defend absolutely the rights of conscience to internal belief, point to the moral warrants for the robust freedom of religious communities, and outline the nuanced Catholic teaching on the rights of believers to act upon their beliefs in their secular pursuits in society. But the, government, the church must be equally dedicated to defending the corresponding right of government to, at times, restrict conscience-driven actions in pursuit of a genuine common good. If we do not point unswervingly to the fullness of Catholic teaching on religious liberty amidst these heated debates, we risk compounding the level of venom within our society and debasing the concept of religious liberty to our own detriment. We must present our case with precision depth, gentility, and compassion, as Murray did. And we must present it in its integrity at every moment. Secondly, an emptiness of the soul. One of the enduring themes of Murray's writings about the nature of American society in the 20th century focused on the concept of the public consensus, which lay at the heart of American political life. The notion of the public consensus was shared by a wide-ranging school of American historians, economists, sociologists in mid-century, and problematically it bore the imprint of a white male elite perspective on American history and institutions. For Murray, the key element of the concept was its foundation in concepts of natural law, which undergirded American society in fundamental ways and provided a linkage between the history of American politics and Catholic thought. The public consensus was for Murray a moral reality, always in need of reinvigoration and renewal in American society. 
It was the glue which held America together at its best, through common moral and spiritual values rather than ties of blood or nationalism. Murray wrote that there was a continual need for reconversion to the public consensus in American society in order to embrace anew the principles of freedom, civic unity, truth, civil conversation, and support for the funda fundamental institutions of American government. In the absence of such a continuing conversion, Murray argued, the United States would confront a spiritual crisis in the temporal realm, a hollowness in American society and culture, an emptiness of the soul. We are living in just such a spiritual crisis, for our national soul has truly become hollowed out. A renewed public consensus for this current moment of crisis must be undertaken, and it must be based upon a national conversion to the principle of solidarity. The principle of solidarity, that great gift to Pope John Paul II to the church and the world, is the recognition in God's grace that we are all debtors of the society of which we are a part. A societal conversion to solidarity in the United States will require deep self-scrutiny and reflection. It will demand a rejection of the tribal element of politics, which sees voting as the opportunity to advance the well-being of our race, our class, our religious community at the expense of others. It will entail a purging of the inherent human tendency to allow anger and wedge issues to destroy our ties as Americans. A spiritual conversion to solidarity among citizens demands that we reject the increasing habit in our political culture of attributing all differences of opinion to ignorance or malice. As Murray noted so frequently in his writings, the continuing renewal of the public consensus in America requires specific structures and norms in American society and government. Three of these are particularly important for a renewal of the public consensus in the current moment. One, we must become a people which treasures civil dialogue and seeks shared truth. Today, so much of our nation's lives in closed media and social media silos, which are deliber deliberately designed to project a particularized version of reality, designed to reinforce our prejudices rather than challenge them. This suffocates the type of national conversation that is vital for a democracy and creates fissures of rivalry and misunderstanding. Part of the reason that our culture is so fragmented is that we see different realities. We must develop the ability to dialogue again across divisions of class, race, faith, ethnicity, gender, and orientation. The reality that young black men fear for their security when facing law enforcement. The sense of dispossession felt by young white men without a college degree. The specter of deportation for mothers and fathers and children in the millions. Rampant patterns of sexual harassment and assault directed against women. The fear that police face every day trying to protect society these are wounds in our society which tear at our social fabric and must be approached with empathy, dialogue, and embrace, not division. Two, we must turn from warfare to governance. The long tradition of an American political culture <clears throat> which valued coherent and effective governance has largely been evacuated in the United States. The war room mentality of the perpetual campaign is deeply corrosive to our society and to our national well-being. While partisanship will be forever intertwined with the action of governance, a dedication to governance over partisan gain must be restored in the coming years if our nation is to flourish, address its many problems, and reconstruct a sense of authentic unity. <coughs> The leadership of both parties must work together on practical issues which can command a majority and move to reform aimed at the common good. The ultimate trajectory of American democracy cannot become a partisanship 
which renders unity impossible, and a politics which turns the ethic of governance into a quaint anachronism. Three, we must build up rather than destroy the institutions which are necessary for our political life. The corrosive nature of our contemporary politics <clears throat> is accentuated by the overpowering trajectory in American political life, which subjects virtually every governmental and private institution in society to partisan scrutiny and judgmentalism. There are government institutions in American public life for which it is essential to maintain a deeply nonpartisan identity so that our democracy can function, and yet these institutions are under attack. The Supreme Court has, from the time of the Bork nomination onward, been subjected to an increasingly partisan prism of judgment which saps its ability to unify and leads us to perilous times. And the scientific and medical agencies of government, which are the envy of the world, are debased by partisan decisions not based upon science or medicine, but partisan agendas. The sickness in the political soul of our nation will only be healed if society undertakes a massive regeneration of the political ties which unite us as a people and begins to see these ties as more important than the divisions which tear us apart. John Courtney Murray may have been wrong in his specific delineation of the public consensus in the United States, but he was not wrong in contending that our nation must continually construct such a consensus if it is to thrive. Finally, the development of doctrine. A third framing principle which John Courtney Murray has provided for the current moment arises not precisely from the content of his writings, but in fact from the courageous, faith-filled, excruciating service which he rendered to the church in his dedication to transforming <clears throat> the doctrine on religious liberty. For Murray's investigation of religious liberty both illuminates the nature of the doctrinal development in the life of the church and points to three dimensions of doctrinal development which must inform theological inquiry today. The first of these dimensions is contained in Pope Benedict's 2005 Address to the Curia, in which he spoke about the hermeneutics of the Second Vatican Council and explicitly pointed to the doctrinal development of Dignitatis Humanae. Benedict emphasized that in the Declaration, quote, the Second Vatican Council <clears throat> recognized in making its own an essential principle of the modern state with the decree has recovered the deepest patrimony of the church, unquote. Murray had always adapted this stance as one of the major foundations for his work on religious liberty. <clears throat> the rule, renewal of doctrine is in part a true recovery of the church's scriptural and doctrinal heritage which at times has become obfuscated by misplaced or outmoded historical assumptions. But a second foundation for Murray's work of doctrinal development was his continuing dedication declaration that new human realities emerge in human history, which demand new answers in the faith. Constitutional democracy was a new moral reality, which demanded theological analysis not bound to the political institutions of the past, but fully reflective of the specific moral, philosophical, and theological principles that arose from modern political societies like the United States. The final foundation for Murray's work was powerfully articulated by Pope Francis last month in his delineation of the nature of doctrinal development during the anniversary celebration of the Catechism of the Church. Quote, the word of God is a dynamic and living reality that develops and grows because it is aimed at a fulfillment that none can halt. The law of progress in the happy formulation of St. Vincent, consolidated by years, enlarged by time, refined by age, is a distinguishing mark of revealed truth as it is handed down by the church. Unquote. John Courtney Murray's theology of doctrinal development 
embraces all three of these essential components of doctrinal development. The recovery of the deepest tradition of the church, the understanding that new elements of the truth of revelation are discovered in the living history of the faith, and a recognition that new human realities demand new doctrinal analyses not, cons not constricted by the contingent structures and assumptions of the past. Murray's death precluded the opportunity for him to develop a more comprehensive theology of doctrinal development. But surely that question is one of the most compelling issues which Murray's life and work pose to the Catholic theological community in the current moment. On August 16, 1967, John Courtney Murray entered a New York taxi cab and died of a heart attack during the journey. Over the years, when the church was facing some complex theological or societal issues, I have with some frequency thought to myself, wouldn't it be wonderful if Murray would emerge from that cab to provide his witness for, wisdom for us today? Or maybe in the age of, say, Fra of Pope Francis, from that subway. But upon deeper reflection of the context of today's discussion, I realize that Murray is still providing that wisdom in the enduring treasure of his scholarship, his faith, and his discipleship. And in this way, he will always be contributing to the growing end of the argument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bishop McElroy. Sure. Here's some. Oh, great. Water. This is the time for public officials to drink <laughs> water out of plastic water bottles. <laughs> uh, well, one of several threes that you gave us, uh, a lot of threes in this talk. I almost wonder if a certain Jesuit influenced you. <laughs> the three tasks that you gave us as heirs of uh, John Courtney Murray. We must become a people which treasures civil dialogue and, seek, and seeks shared truth. We must turn from warfare, conflict, to uh, governance. And we must build up rather than destroy the institutions which are necessary for our political life. Do you think um, that an, a public consensus is possible in today in the way that Murray saw it, gathering the intellectuals uh, on grounds that they had enough to share, that they could be led to fruitful and creative um, argument? Well, I would say this. I think it is a mistake to think of the public consensus that we need in our country as being par par particularly the work of intellectuals. I think it needs to be the work of the whole community. I think it also has to be not just something of the, of the mind, but something of the heart and the soul. And I think all of those need to be, come into play on this uh, because it, it really requires a conversion of how we approach these questions in our society. I, I do believe it's possible we'll come to some terrible crisis in the society which causes us to do that, but my hope is we could do it absent that. But, but uh, so I do think that there can be renewal. We've gone through in our history many periods of time of, of terrific um, upheaval. You know, I, I mean, myself, I was more concerned in, in, say, 1968 about the, the collapse of society than I am now. But it's bad now. It's bad and now. So, and so... Um, uh, At those times, we had the House Un-American Activities Committee that this group, this group in California was meeting as a kind of, of, of argument yeah. against uh, this approach and the witch hunts and everything. And, and, and there was a way, uh, I do think Murray in a certain sense was an institutionalist, that he, he felt the institution, and I say that, listen, Francesca, you would know better, to, because you probably listened to more than I did out at Santa Barbara, but when I was in Santa Barbara in those discussions, that was a very important element for him and for all those who were discussing it. And I do think it's for us, part of the consensus has to point to the role of institutions. And that as they go down one by one and get enveloped in this, that's a great loss that we have to work mm -hmm. against, I think. Um, 
So we have microphones for questions. Here they come. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Kirk Kramer, and I would like to ask uh, Bishop McElroy a question about Archbishop Quinn. Because he was your friend, and because he was one of the wisest and most learned churchmen that the church in America has ever seen, and because he died recently. I, I'm just curious if, in your long friendship with him, if you ever had discussions with him about Father Murray, and if he had any particular insights or ideas about Father Murray uh, that you remember. Well, let me put it to you this way. When I was, I was a young priest, and I was uh, two years in Paris, and I was Archbishop Quinn's secretary for three years. At the end of that, Archbishop Quinn said to me, I want you to go to Rome and to study John Courtney Burry. So, so that, which I happily did. Uh, um, so Murray had given a retreat at the North American College during the time that uh, John was a seminarian. And it was one of the riveting experiences of his life that he carried with him. He could remember with great precision what had the point he'd made, and he was immensely impressed by both the substance and the style. And, and in a very way, if you knew Archbishop Quinn, he was a man of great civility and dialogue himself. And, uh, and, and as, as questions were posed, and he took positions, of course, that were not without controversy, both in term, internally and externally in the life of church, but he was always a man trying to build the public consensus through dialogue and civility. So, but yes, there was a, this one connection was the retreat, and it was a major moment in his life. Yes, other questions? Anyone? Yes. Hi, Bishop McElroy. Thank Hi. you for your presentation. Um, I just had, um, I wanted to ask you your thoughts about, you use the word dialogue a lot, and Pope Francis has been using this word over and over since um, he was elected. And um, I find in my work that I do doing dialogue that um, people don't often know what that means in the rich history and theology of dialogue. And I was wondering if you could speak to how um, the Catholic theology of, the, of dialogue could contribute to the civil discourse um, in our country. Well, the way actually that Murray got into in his early writings and work was it wasn't ecumenical dialogue because you couldn't say it then. It was called intercredal cooperation. And th that was the term, intercredal cooperation. <clears throat> you could work alongside each other in a common effort with a common goal, but it was like you, you couldn't talk about God along the way, you know. It, it was an odd sort of framework. <clears throat> but his early writings were on this question, defending the notion that there could be working together. And <clears throat> that strikes me that that might be, now it's the opposite in a sense of what Murray says, because Murray comes through dialogue first. But in a very real way, for our country in terms of public consensus, it may have to emerge and may best emerge from working together toward common goals rather than dialogue working out all the foundations for that before we begin to do that, those actions of solidarity together. I think Murray was thinking too in dialogue in an American context as public engagement. And in contrast to, I think, Paul VI, who, who <clears throat> enshrined dialogue in his first yeah. encyclical, Ecclesium Suum, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. yes. Question over here. Yes, Tom. Uh, in the earlier discussions, there was uh, a discussion of the difference between process and substance in consensus on that. I wonder if you could speak to that. Do you? Uh, because, I mean, you're, you seem to be focusing on a consensus about substance, I think. Now, where do you, how would you enter into that conversation? Well, to make that consensus even more complex, my own view is <clears throat> the, 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 the subject of the public consensus during the 1950s and, and 60s arose from a particular school uh, of historians, economists, 
and uh, sociologists. A Hofstadter would be one. A. A. Burrell would, would, would be another. Um, uh, uh, oh. The islands, I forget the islands of, he wrote Islands of Liberalism would be the third within political science. And their argument was, and, and, I, and Murray bought into this argument to a sense, but he went in a different direction. <clears throat> the consensus school, Borston was one, is and the consensus school question was, in a sense, it's what's at the root of American exceptionalism? And they phrased it as, why did the United States, why was the United States not consumed by the paroxysms of revolution internally and the, the pre-World War II and then the World War II issues um, the way Europe was? And their, their answer to that was, uh, broadly, that, that there's, there's a non-ideological nature to American politics, and they found it in this notion of consensus. Now, as I mentioned, it was a very white elite notion of consensus. It was not inclusive, as we would look on it today. Um, <clears throat> but Murray used that word, but he assigned to it a different meaning. He wanted to make it more filled with natural law thinking, to make it first compatible with Catholic thinking, but also because he repeatedly said in his writings, um, <clears throat> the consensus is not merely processes. It is a set of substantive truths of rights and about our humanity. And so that's why I think it did include process, but it wasn't, I don't even know if I'd say it was predominantly process. It was, I think, both and in that question. Yes, Bishop, right. Bishop, you and John were in the Vatican uh, before the Bishop's Conference. I'm just wondering, um, in these days and times, Ray Kemp's my name. I uh, am a priest of D.C., um, happily here. Um, in the midst of this incredible um, fascination we have with guns and in the midst, uh, in the presence of those who've written statements, the bishops on peace, and the nuclear um, decision that came to be as you two were in the Vatican. How in God's name and in the name of John Murray and in the name of the common good would you interpret to Catholics of the United States um, no nukes? <laughs> That's particularly hard for you, if I'm not mistaken. Your diocese is home of the Pacific Fleet? It is. <laughs> it, uh, it, it is the, the home of the Pacific Fleet. And then we have uh, a large Air Force base, too. So the military is very strong in the diocese. <clears throat> and a great blessing. Uh, the, the, our military families are great members of the parishes. <clears throat> um, the Pope took a step, um, and Drew can speak to this, uh, um, well, we were there during this conference, and, and for the first time, I believe, uh, the Pope said, possession itself of nuclear weapons must be condemned. Right. Now, um, to me, what that means is that there is a moral imperative to disarmament that is much more prominent now and that there, there must be steps toward a progressive <clears throat> and substantive disarmament. My own, my own interpretation of that is, is important, and this is for my own people at, in home in San Diego and for any people in the military. It's very important to understand <clears throat> with Catholic moral theology, that doesn't mean that because an action of the state is morally wrong and needs to be rectified by moving toward disarmament, it doesn't mean that anyone who is in service to the state is involved in wrongful moral action. That it just, Catholic moral theology doesn't work that way. So I think it's important to understand that. But, but uh, there's this treaty that's been then uh, passed to, in which most of the nations of the world, but the United, not the United States, have, have committed themselves to ending nuclear weapons. And um, uh, what it's really founded upon the logic is this. The deterrence, which for many years was thought of as a stabilizing factor, has become destabilizing 
in the shift in the environment from a bipolar world to, to increasing uh, proliferation. And the, 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 you know, we're coming to a point where there will be increasing incentives. If, if, as I suspect will happen, North Korea retains its weapons because there aren't good military options, and I don't think there's going to be a decision by the North Korean government to give up their weapons. That's gonna be a clear signal to other countries that have been threatened uh, by the, either their neighbors or by others, that it, nukes are an incentive, uh, you know, are a, a defense, and especially against regime change. So uh, the, I think what the, the Holy See was saying is we're slipping into a more dangerous world, not a less dangerous world. Uh, Pope John Paul accepted nuclear deterrence as ethical, and the, the phrase was as a step on the road to disarmament. The, the Vatican position became about two years ago that uh, the ethic of deterrence the, and the actuality of deterrence is itself destabilizing now. And then last week it became thus possession is, is not morally acceptable now. But that just means we have to move off it. It's, it. it's a guard against complacency, which we've all fallen into, I think. So I know that Brian was going to ask, ask something. Brian. Do we have a microphone? Brian? You have spoken about U.S. foreign policy at various times and about the sort of nationalistic dimension yeah. of it. Um, I tried to think about what Murray would think about what the administration calls principled realism, because I think Murray worked from a realist framework of his own definition. My own sense is that he would have described that phrase this way, that the principles run from the foggy to the fallacious, and the realism is unrealistic. But it's an entirely different thing moving from that easy critique to talk about what the agenda of issues are on a number of questions about how you get from here to there. So my sense is that your critique of America first and nationalism are, are two important but simpler targets than how you respond to those. You have a sense of that? Um, I think that's true. I think the, the nationalism, we're seeing, nationalism we're seeing is twofold. One is <clears throat> in the international sphere, okay? But the other is internally. The nationalism which says uh, and this Murray was dead set against. He, he really argued, we are not a nation because we are tied together by blood uh, or by ethnic hi histories. We, we are a nation precisely of immigrants and we're tied together by, the, his argument was by this consensus. But um, it's, it's the internal nationalism that's very frightening to me because it's a way of, it's the opposite of consensus building. It's deconstructing the society in very dangerous ways. And um, uh, well, I think Michael Kazin teaches here, does he? Uh, and and uh, he writes on um, uh, the history of uh, uh, populism. And uh, as I believe, I don't want to mischaracterize, but if I recall what he says is, is that Kazin argues there are two types of populism in the United States. Populism always uh, attacks elites, okay? It always does that. But there's one populism that attacks elites. There's another one that attacks elites, but then also finds victims who are not elites, people who are picked on in society and goes after them as well. I fear we're in that kind of a populist moment and uh, under the guise of nationalism, you know, particularly with the undocumented, with the Muslim community. So that nationalism is very dangerous to me. I, I do think a challenge to us as a country and to the to the whole of the world really is, and what I say with this is nationalism, goes back to Pachamanteras and the idea of an international common good. In a global world, there is an international common good in Catholic teaching. Um, uh, even though the, there's not an international government in a sense that's full-bodied, but there is an international common good. So particularly on questions like nuclear weapons, or on the environment, 
our national interest cannot ethically be pursued without integrating it against the background of an international common good. What does it do to the, to the international uh, community as a whole? And I think that's the great work that Catholic teaching has to give to us at this moment and why substantively uh, the nationalism that's being advanced doesn't make sense. Excellent, excellent. I think this is a fine, fine place to um, end this session uh, and take a, a short break, about five minutes, while the next panel is miked and there's more food, so help yourself. And please join me in again thanking Bishop McElroy sure. for this engaging conversation.